Yo, yo, welcome back to the Audio Theory Podcast. If you're new to the channel, please hit the like button as well as the subscribe button. We got a special guest who's back for the second time, Johan Lennox. Really appreciate you joining us for a oh, second yeah, round. Yes. Welcome back, bro. Really excited. One of Thank our favorite guests me. for sure. Thank Always. you. Yeah, man. So like last, like last episode, kind of our shtick is like asking a couple random ass questions just to get the, the nerves loose and just make sure everyone yeah. just gets a kind of different side of you. Um, so I have one question for you. Since our last episode, you, you talked, you told us you're a big uh, drink aficionado. So like, what's a drink you've made on tour that you're like a big fan of? That's a good question. Um, well, basically what happened was for most of the tour, like you're just pulling up to these random cities and we did have a lot of flights. I think it actually might have been, maybe if we had driven the whole tour, I would have done it differently because then I maybe would have just stocked up on like a home bars with sure. this stuff in a trunk so I could mix drinks in the room. Oh shit, my shit's tweaking a little bit. <laughs> it's probably gonna, let me just turn my AC on. My shit's like overheated. Oh, good. Yeah, sure. Just, just, just give me five seconds. Yeah, you're good. Yep. It looked like cover art, though, to be honest. It should have cut a fire. <laughs> I know. It was like a, a fucking painting. <laughs> yeah. You could use... I'll screenshot it and send it to him. You could use it for your next album. I know. It looks crazy. I know. It, it's going to be fun. I mean, I got to, like, get my shit fixed because I started doing like, live streaming. And then basically once I got... When I, when I installed all the, like, live streaming software and shit, it just, like, fucked my computer up forever. But, oh, I got you. So it's like every. Everything works fine, but if, if it overheats just for a slight second, everything completely fucking fails. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, you know, what happens is you pull up to these different venues and you get a rider. And so it's like if I, if I, you can put stuff on there, but I mean, we're the opener and people in different cities don't necessarily know like what, you don't know what, what they're going to be able to find. Or like, yeah, yeah. They're not, they're not like going out of their way to make sure you're happy. They're just getting you the shit that you asked for within reason. So, yeah, so we kept it pretty simple. We had like a bottle of Espolón tequila in every city. Sometimes they give us Casamigos, which is nice. Um, orange juice, which I did not mix with the tequila at any point. It was just a separate thing. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then we would ask for beers. And we started out asking for Stella, because that's what my like tour manager asked for. And I don't really, I didn't really want to do that. And I just wanted, for, I don't really like those, but I also just wanted like variety. Mm -hmm. And I thought if we just asked for a good local beer, we would get some nice shit that way. And so we did. And so every city we get like whatever the local thing was. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And then, it's, but as far as mixing cocktails, yeah, just, I don't know. I mean, I could have asked for like to, to really have the freedom I need to mix shit. I want like, you know, a good, substantial amount of stuff and like it's like yeah. what are we going to do get that ask for that in every city or like ask for <laughs> one bottle of each thing in every city and it's just like I, I don't want to pay to do that myself if I can just get free shit so yeah. the answer is not much but what did happen was we came to LA and I had a lot of these leftover this like batched cocktail that I had made in just like bottles basically pre-made for a release party I had out here a couple months ago and I still have some of that left over. So when we were in LA, we did four nights in LA at the end of the tour. Damn. I just brought a couple of bottles of that and a shaker to the venue every night and just got ice from the bar and just like made drinks for people in the back, which was fucking fantastic. Oh, shit. So, yeah, that's a dope way to end the tour. Yeah. yeah. So I want to do more of that because that was really fun. And I felt like I was, you know, it was a, it was a good, fun, green room experience of just like chugging tequila out of a bottle yeah take the shot it's like oh, all right. which is also fun <laughs> nice nice and what was in that concoction you made before you went on tour uh there was a couple one was like a variant on like a whiskey sour and the other one was sort of like a gin also sour but with the uh, amaro in it which is my obsessive uh that's like the thing my, the italian shit that i'm obsessed with so that nice. one's pretty popular with the people so yeah sweet yeah like yeah this one's a bit more left field but if your life depended on either the existence of aliens or ghosts which one are you betting on oh like which one i think is more real yeah essentially or yeah, neither if you aliens don't. by a million fold yeah not yeah no yeah 100 percent. i probably rock with I'm that all in on aliens 
Yeah, I don't know, you, man. Danny. I mean, it's like it turns out people to find ghosts. I mean, if you literally mean like the spirits of the dead that have walked, yeah, them, spirits you know, of the dead. Then yeah, no. But if you're talking about like some like invisible <laughs> beings and shit that like maybe are also extraterrestrial, like that, there might be some shit like that out there. I don't know. Fair. There is this shit called the Fermi paradox. I don't know if you ever ever read about this shit. No. It's like, I won't get too deep into it. It gets kind of heady, but there's a lot of scientists that have opinions on this shit i guess but basically the idea is like it's it doesn't it doesn't really make any sense that we haven't heard from aliens in a conclusive way because like there's like if you think about the technology we have and all the like waves we send out into the universe mm -hmm. and we've only been doing that shit for like 50 years and there's planets that are like a billion years older than us that would have hit that point of intelligence a billion years ago like there's hundreds of trillions of these planets how is it that no one ever thought to try to contact anyone else in a way that we could see at any point? And, you know, it just doesn't make any yeah. sense. None. Doesn't Unless make any they sense. realize how ghetto Earth is and they're like, you don't want to <laughs> fuck with them well, So that, like, that's like one of the explanations, basically. <laughs> it's just like different, but there's like, yeah, there's different explanations. I mean, one is that like, that play, you know, an, an, one explanation would be that like planets get to the level we're at right now in mm -hmm. 2022 and like, they only make it like another 50 years or something and Yikes. they just fucking die. You know, that's like one explanation. I mean, so <laughs> I that that one. Right, I like, <laughs> then it would mean that it's happened many, many times, but they just never got far enough past that to just like really, you know, line up with this at the right time or, you know, it's just like all these different, you know, uh, or another possibility is that like no planet has ever gotten a life this intelligent ever for mm. the first one, which is pretty fucking unlikely, but could happen. It's shit like this. Yeah. What they awesome. think about it. But nobody knows. Yeah, I go aliens. Nobody well, knows. Nice. There's an explanation um, that's sorry. I'll do one more. There's one that's like, yeah, maybe we, like, <laughs> maybe we live in like a zoo, basically, and they just don't do that because they don't want to disturb us in our habitat, and they're just watching. Us. Yeah, I've heard that. Oh, one. I've heard that one before. I think that's fair. Because I mean, th there's been a lot of sightings, and people are like, well, why don't they just fucking hang out with us and yeah. turn us into slaves or whatever? But maybe we are. We're the show. Like, you don't disturb yeah. the show. <laughs> yep. Like ants, or we're, or we're in like the cons we're like being conserved, you know. We're like the Amazon rainforest for them. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, another question for me. So obviously, while you're on tour, I just because I know it dropped when your album dropped, or maybe the week before. Did you get a chance to listen to Kendrick's album? Yeah. So if you had to choose between uh, part one or part two, what was your favorite and why? Oh, uh, that's too that's too too much pressure. I don't know. <laughs> I'll listen again and get back to you. I like listened to it twice in a car while I was like hanging out with people. Oh no worries, you did take like a deep dive into it. Uh, yeah, the whole thing was fire though. I really liked all the production texture, all that like weird piano stuff, and just mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I just keep he's just always on some interesting shit. You know, it's never gonna like it's never just gonna be like a rap song. It's always got to have some weird shit going on, and I think that yeah, that's just even sonically that's sort of what I like about it. Yeah, I think it had like Kodak on it too. It was like such a, it felt like left field, but it kind of was so like perfect. Yeah, it's good to do that. I mean, uh, Tyler had like NBA Young Boy on his album, mm -hmm. and that you mm -hmm. know, it's just like so random. Good shit, great. it's good shit, and like yeah, I think that I, I try to have unexpected pairings of artists and stuff on my records, and just try to be like, damn, I really was not expecting that like thousand band funny on those strings, but you know, there it is, and it's just like that i think it's good to be able to surprise people i think features are a good way that you can you can be interesting and different with the, like it's an opportunity to do something interesting artistically and so yeah just but it's funny how it. like sometimes when you think the per like these two should work perfectly together it's like ah it's just they didn't so, really do sure yeah or it's like just the same shit twice that's how i felt yeah. when i heard uh, post malone and kid Leroy together i was like yeah sure i felt I, uh, this was gonna work <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I uh, I definitely hear you on that. But yeah, I mean, I feel like it also comes down to the production. But yeah, no, I, I'm more excited about using the production as a way to pull together like really, really unexpected pairings and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're very similar, you don't really need to do that as much. But then it's like, what are you going to do to differentiate it, I guess? Yeah. To make it like a different, yeah, I feel that. Yeah. Good answer, good answer. Yeah. Thanks. Um, would you rather be held in high regard by your parents or your friends? That's a that's a great question. That's a really good question. I mean, that, I mean, it's it's it really like I think everyone answers 
to that question just depends on like how much their parents love them i think as a kid right my parents yeah. have just been unequivocal in supporting me from day one mm. so it's like it's hard for me to imagine what it would be like to not have them hold me in high regard right. but i guess it's also like man, that's a fucking great question I just feel like my parents and my friends both are just kind of like unconditional. It's like they don't hold me in high regard. They just hold me like they respect me and exactly as much as I earn it. <laughs> and I think I like do cool shit and they respect that. But that's not like the basis of my friendship or my relationship with my parents. I guess it's a little bit more of the basis of my relationship with my parents. But they're it's like they're they're un yeah, it's it's definitely un what's the word? Un, unconditional. Like, unconditional, yeah. I was gonna say unequivocal, which is I guess also true. kind of same thing yeah yeah. yeah 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 that they that yeah it's like unconditional so it's like and i think my friends for the most part it's the same thing as long as you like stay in touch and stuff but hold in high regard i mean I, I i guess i'm thinking about career shit which is how i think when i hear high regard i'm always kind of like well you know that's the lens i think of it but there's other ways to think about it too like if all your friends start to think you've turned into a douchebag or that you're like drinking yeah. too much or something then that could be I'm trying to think. Uh, I guess in that case, I'd probably have. I'd care more about my friends. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I, I think just my parents are way. closer to. Like, I trust their judgment slightly more. I guess about what I should be doing, but who fucking knows, man? <laughs> I really don't know. I try not to think about that stuff. Yeah, it's tough, especially in this social media era. Because um, I mean, even if, let's say theoretically you were behaving like a douchebag, your parents might call you out, but they're not going to really love you less. Whereas your friend might straight up switch up yeah, on you because yeah, yeah. there's yeah. not really that blood tie. But it depends on That's the true. friends too, obviously. It's just funny. It's an interesting question because it's like I spend, you know, like 90% of my life trying really hard to, you know, attain high regard from total strangers. So it's like yeah. those, the two groups that you mentioned kind of like get short shrifted a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that's a great I guess that's why they have to be unequivocal, unconditional. Yeah. Uh, last nice. one for me, as far as like uh, fun ones, obviously just a kind of tangent to the album. Fuck this town, probably one of my favorite songs in a minute. So kudos to you for that. Um, you. What are like, what's like the worst thing about going home for you? Good question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is just that always my shit's like. Like, there's like a power strip under my bed that I've plugged my phone into because that's like the nearest outlet to my bed, but the outlet is not reachable. But the power strip is always unplugged when I get back. So I have to like, <laughs> like crawl under the bed and plug it back in in order to plug my phone into my bed. That's probably the worst single thing. Wait, how does it get unplugged? I think that the cleaning lady or something probably just does it and then they just don't bother to move it because no one's in that room ever. And so, <laughs> so when you come back home, you actually stay with your parents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, I mean, like, you know, on longer trips, I feel like me and my parents, you know, if it's like, if I'm there for weeks, eventually we just get like real snippy at each other, you know? Yeah. It's just like, I don't yeah, want to be normal. You know? Like, yeah. So that sucks. But I, that hasn't really happened as much with COVID because it's just like, they're sort of getting older and being pretty cautious about that stuff. So it's like, most of the trips I've taken were like either during the summer when we could like eat outside a lot or like, I had to like get tested a bunch before I came out or maybe quarantine for a day or two, you know, before I like stayed in the house or whatever. So it like, it was always like very like little and precious time that I got to spend with them. I think that we're mostly kind of back to normal now, but that kept it from ever getting too like stagnant or whatever. But another thing is like, there's never really like food in the fridge. Is that like, that's a pretty normal thing, right? That people, is that a, is that a common thing that people feel like they go back to their parents' house and like, now that they don't live there, their parents aren't really like stocking the shit. Yeah, that's a normal thing. Like, yeah. I had that when I go home to my and aunt. So then like, you're she just never like, oh, shit. yeah, there's fuck, never what shit. What do I fucking eat? And like, yeah, and my parents don't like eat that much, and they don't really eat that much of shit I would want to eat and shit. And like, the... <laughs> but it's also like I'm too lazy. You know, it's like clearly I, the answer is like I should just be taking care of myself. But it's like, yeah. you're, like you're home <laughs> and you're like, oh, man. finally <laughs> I get to just like <laughs> relax and I'm home, and it's just like no, gotta. Yeah. yeah, for me, my biggest beef when I go like visit like where I grew up, it's that like everyone expects the person who's visiting to be the person who like runs around to go meet everyone. Like 
I'm like, yo, how can you make my life easier? Like, I'm the one visiting, bro. Like, I don't want to be like a Uber, like driving around to fucking meet you people. Like, come to oh, one I place. I see what you're saying. You mean like your friends and shit? Yeah. Well, even family. Like, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, you're in town. Come over. I'm like, you live 45 minutes away, bro. Like, I don't have a car. Yeah. Like, you figure it out. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good one. I mean, I definitely. I mean, I relate to that more. It's like I feel when I go back to my hometown, it's like not much. It's like I see my parents, but like all all my like good friends have moved out and are like mm. in New York or something. So it's like I'm not really seeing them, and I don't have other family outside of my parents in that town either. So okay, so you kind of like, that like of that's pretty convenient. But I do think what's true about that is that, and people complain about this a lot with LA, and I think it's maybe true in New York too, but definitely true in LA that people like come all the way to LA and they're like, what's up, Johan, I'm in LA. And I'm like, like, where are you in LA? And they're like, oh, I'm in like Venice. And it's like, bro, that's like a fucking hour away. Like I'm not going to Venice. <laughs> I mean, for certain people I will, but like for most people, sure. it's like, can we please not do that? Like, um, but it is kind of rude. Cause it's like, they did a come to all, all the way to LA, but like, why'd they come there? Like, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's not my LA. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And that's like not, I mean, Venice to where I am is sort of like clear across the entire city. So it's like, sort of like, if you were in New York, it'd be like, you know, uh, like the Bronx to like Brooklyn or something. Yeah. It's like, it's an hour, you know? So it's not like, it's, it's not, that's not just because LA is sprawly. It's like, that's just, you're just on the wrong side of the city for where I live. And, you know, fair enough. You're not visiting me. It's cool, but that's a factor. But then the other thing that's even funnier to me sometimes is that people will say they're in LA and they'll be in a place that is just definitionally not LA. Not LA. <laughs> yeah, like they're in a place that's like an hour and a half away from where I live and which just on a map is not LA. I mean, maybe it's like LA Riverside County, or some it's shit. definitely not. Yeah, like fucking like, <laughs> like, I don't even know where the fuck people have, you know, like Long Beach or something. I mean, I guess maybe Long Beach is LA, but I'm pretty sure it's just fucking Long Beach. That's like a, it's like shit, a different with, city. With traffic, you know? that's a whole state away. Yeah, that's not... It's, I don't know, like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? Like, you know, it's like no. so it's just, it, I mean, that'd be like coming and being like, oh, I'm in New York. And someone who lives in like Manhattan is like, oh, where? And they're like halfway down Long Island. It's like, no, yeah, not really like, yeah, you got to come to me, man. So. Yeah, you got to come to, that's my point. You have to come to me. Like, if, if I'm the one that, yeah, I feel that. I feel that. I, feel I that. suck it. Whatever. I'll, I'll see anyone. I'll hang with almost anybody if it's convenient for me. Mm hmm. But I like I like inconvenient. If it's inconvenient, I'll, I'll almost never see anybody ever. <laughs> so that's funny. It's yeah, like when I'm I went to New York in March, it was like a, we got snowed in one day, and I was yeah. like, "Oh, this is perfect. I can't, I can't go see anyone. I can just stay here." Like it's phenomenal. That's funny as hell. I mean, I like seeing my friends and stuff, but yeah, usually it's like when I'm in New York, I usually try to like kind of plan a little bit, not plan, but I try to like stack the appointments so it's like oh yeah if i'm in williamsburg well i may as well just see these other three people yeah, yeah, yeah. because i'm physically there and that's the only reason i see them on that trip is because i had to be you know what i mean so uh but yeah i like i like uh not traveling a lot yeah yeah i'm from la i'm actually going back uh tomorrow for two weeks and i've already nice. been planning out my itinerary of like all right, I got to go to the Valley for these four people, then to the West side. Right. Then see people in Orange County. And I'm not driving, so it's going to be, I'm going to spend like probably a thousand in Ubers. Oh, just trying to stay up with people. Yeah, not a thousand, but definitely. No, I mean, you're spending probably money, fucking will, man. Like if you're really, yeah. maybe not that, yeah. Especially with maybe gas. At least 600 or so, 700. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Jeez. And a couple of times you're going to get fucked and you're going to be like, what Fuck should have been 30. <laughs> no, there's yeah. a couple of times it's going to hit where, because I take, I don't let drive in LA. I only take Uber, so I know what you can and yeah. can't do cheaply. And like, yeah. you can get around the main, like central part of LA, you know, but yeah, if you're trying to get, you know, it's like, if you have to get back to Orange County or from Orange County and it's a Friday night, sometimes just suddenly that's what <laughs> happened. It's going to be like a yeah. hundred. Yeah. Plus. No, fuck that. Yeah, I'm going to take on. my running shoes and just figure it out. <laughs> All right, but you got one more? Uh, yeah, let's do one more. Um, speaking of getting stranded, would you rather be homeless but never have to work or work a job that you absolutely hate for the rest of your life? Probably homeless. I mean, I can't really say that I've never been homeless, but I think homeless has a lot of definitions. You know, homeless could just mean like couch surfing. Like, yeah, more or less what I did the first couple of years I was in LA and like, 
I wasn't stoked, but it was fucking way better than having, like having a boss is absolutely the most miserable thing <laughs> I've ever experienced to the extent no that I have, which I basically <laughs> have, it just fucking sucks. It's like not like really, yeah, like having a punch in and shit like that. Every time I get even close to feeling that way, I don't even fucking do like mixes for people on records because I just don't want to get notes back and have to do them. I only mm -hmm. do shit where I can just do what I want and then send it out and that's it. That's the process. And it's like, I'm really lucky, you know, and I've worked really hard to get to that point. But yeah, no, that there's few things I value more than like the ability at any given moment to just like decide what I'm gonna do with my time, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's the best luxury I think anyone can have. Yeah, and I'll, I'll sacrifice quality of life like to an extreme, extreme degree to get there. Yeah. And people who know me and see me do that. Yeah, too. I feel you on that. Sweet. All right, let's get into it then, bro. Yeah, let's dive in. Obviously, you just got off your first tour, I wanna say. Yeah. Your, or your first major tour at congrats, least. Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, congrats. You. What, before you got on tour, how did this all pan out and what were your expectations um, in your mind before everything went into action? Um, for tour, I think, um, I don't know. It's like, it's, it feels like the distant past. It's almost like there's a before that and now there's the after. <laughs> I've just been wanting to get on tour for like five years since I started doing this shit really. And it just never felt in reach. And then suddenly it was like, very within reach and then like three days later it was happening like it was just so last minute that like i basically didn't have even a second to plan anything i mean i just had to like i had prepared like the music more or less for a tour like around the time i was finishing the album i was just like let's just have a live setup ready to go let's assume we're going to do some shows around the album we'll assume there's going to be something that's going to come together don't know what kind of just like manifested it almost by just like being ready for a thing you know so we, I did rehearsals and shit last fall without having any shows planned, just being like, well, we just gotta be ready, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it, it was worth it. And I think, yeah, so the live setup, oh, and then, and then I did do one show in New York in- Oh, with for Eli. Eli Sostra, yeah, yeah, in uh, March. And I'm yeah, gonna hopefully do more with him. He's amazing. I'm hopefully gonna do, whenever he does a tour this year, it'll probably only be a few cities, but I'll probably do that with him. Um, so that was kind of the first taste I had of it. So I sort of got a set together for that, made a couple tweaks, did this release party out here. I guess around the same time actually was, yeah, that's, that was all in March, Jesus, okay. So then, in, yeah, so then we planned like a, in a, two album shows around the release of the album, which were Mercury Lounge in New York and Moroccan Lounge in LA. We actually did do those, even though they ended up being in the middle of the Shake Tour. But I planned those and then did a little bit of prep for those with just a longer full headlining length set with, you know, some interludes and I did a, a, a piano cover of a Nirvana song called Dumb. And then, yeah, so that was all basically ready. And then the Shake Tour basically just got booked on three days notice. She had been okay. talking about wanting me to do, well, she had it booked for a while, but I guess for whatever reason, the openers hadn't been figured out. Right, because we wanted to ask you that because when we met up with you in December, you were on your way after us to go work on our album. So we figured this was happening since December that it's like in the works. It would have, well, I would have been announced then because if you look at the ticketing sites and stuff, I wasn't really listed. Got gotcha. you, okay. So they, have, they all updated it, but it was like so last minute. Um, no, I mean, like, I don't really know why that happened that way. I mean, there was, I think at one point there had been a different opener booked for some of those, so maybe they canceled or some shit, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and then I also beats. had, yeah, it worked out amazing for me. And then there was also, I mean, at that time we had been discussing having me open for her just doing this like orchestral set only, like just pure classical music, which was like this thing that she wanted to do mm. that like no one else on her team seemed to really know about or have any plan for how they were gonna make that happen, uh, which is how most things happen in music. but. I had that in the back of my mind, and then it was just in the three days before the tour, they were like, okay, not only is that happening, but actually you're just the opener, so you're gonna do a full set for the entire fucking thing. And then there had been also a brief discussion of, of maybe I was gonna play in her band also, and that was part mm. of how it was gonna kind of come together, but that 
didn't happen. I played with her before, but it was honestly like a blessing for me not to have to get off stage after doing an hour of music and then- And then get right back on. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was good to end him. But you know, it could have been fun either way. But anyway, I think that was maybe part of why it happened was she was just like, no, I want him on the road so he can be in my band. And they're like, all right, well, maybe we let him do the opening set. I don't know, something like that. You know, you need to get to in detail, but that was more or less what I heard. And then it was just kind of, yeah. Uh, and, and then it came together and then she wanted me to still do the orchestral set in addition to my main thing, just in New York and LA and Boston. Mm. So, and it was only one Boston show we actually did it on, but yeah. So for those shows, I then had to like prepare this orchestra set. Actually, you know what? I think I thought that we were gonna do that on the whole tour because the first show was in Detroit. And I was like, that was, I think the Friday night God, I'm trying to this. It was a Saturday night, okay? Tuesday night, I think, or Wednesday morning, I think we confirmed I was during the tour. I think something like that. Okay. So, yeah. So then I think I best spent like all of Wednesday writing that classical piece, just writing 20 minutes of classical music, which is the most insane thing I've ever yeah. done. I think it <laughs> out, but I literally, it's like, that's something most people would spend months on. And if I had done it normally, I would have spent months on it. But instead, I did the entire thing in one day. Did a little bit of cleanup, I think, the next day, that Thursday morning. Did a rehearsal Thursday afternoon where we just ran the classical set, ran my main set, made sure everything was okay. I made a couple adjustments. Friday, I flew to Detroit, and there was also a wedding that my friend was having in Detroit. So I like still was like, no, I'm gonna make the wedding. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like insane coincidence, by the way. I was planning on going to Detroit for six months before this happened. And then the first show, oh, wow. the same night of, as the wedding in Detroit. So I sort of like didn't really technically make the wedding, but made the like, night before stuff and the, gotcha. you know, the after party on it was like a little bit rude but i think people <laughs> were accommodating and yeah so i flew out and then just friday night had like a good time and then saturday afternoon just showed up at this venue in detroit i think it's the majestic theater or something like that it was called did the set it went great it was really and then but okay but then at the at the venue they were like oh yeah we're not doing that classical thing that's only new york boston like, oh so i could have just waited you know i tried <laughs> to have it done but i didn't have to i could have just been slowly writing it this whole time but whatever it was good. And then, and then the first time we did that was at Terminal 5 in New York, the biggest show I've ever done. 3,000 people sold out. Wow. And we did wow. the main set. We did a classical set. And the classical set was cool because it was just like, I had violins in my shit too, but the classical set was really all about the violins and the piano. And it was just like one, it wasn't like a bunch of broken up like movements or songs or whatever. It was really just like one continuous, ended up getting cut down to 15 minutes, straight classical music. And it's just like, very intense experience. Just play 15 I minutes straight and just get all this applause and shit. It was fucking sick. And people were going nuts. Like all these like young kids that came out to see like basically like an emo. Yeah, that's what R &B I. R&B rap <laughs> yeah. show. Just being like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> just like lighting and stuff. It was amazing. It was so cool. And then we did it yeah. in LA. And it just went really well. And that's like, I mean, I'm sure you remember from last time we talked about this, but like that is kind of what I'm trying to do in the long run. It's just that shit. So this is like the singing is like a way into that mm. it's like because it's like people people know yeah. how to follow an artist and listen to a song and then the hope is that if i can get a really strong fan base and just name recognition that there's going to be an audience this down to then also check out like johan just does straight up a symphony and that's mm -hmm. the next right. thing i mean that that's something that people would be down to see which you know i think people would be down to see it if kanye did it so i think that you know yeah the goal is just to get that kind of cloud i guess so. especially if they're already like bought into you it's like all right let's give them the, the yeah i don't know how to describe it to people any other way that yeah it's like a platform just like it's like fame i guess it's not maybe not like purely fame because it's like certain people are famous who probably wouldn't have where no one would want to hear a symphony from sure. them but it's some kind of just respect i guess and just that people are willing to go with you down this path because they trust you i guess yeah yeah, yeah. since the that genre is i guess a bit more mellow or emo as you described it in that instance you find shake? that you don't uh well shake and just uh your own oh, set shit. that was yeah, more yeah, like yeah. orchestral yeah. Oh, you shit, find yeah. that you don't really have to uh worry about crowd work in those instances I'm just thinking of stereotypical rap shows where they're running. Yeah, no, around, no. Like, I was actually to talking to somebody at lunch stuff. about this. I had lunch with this dude, Mark E. Basie, who's like a oh yeah, yeah. from dude. the Bay. Yes, and he does. You know, he it, that, he saw my show last week in L.A. and he was like, he was like, it's cool that you didn't have to do that stuff. Was kind of what he said, and it was. 
And I was cool because I don't really like, I don't think I can do that shit very authentically. I mean, there's probably some version of it that I can. We have a moment in the set where we get everyone like waving their like um, phone lights and shit. Mm-hmm. And my DJ just sets it up, just like he just holds his phone light up and then just starts doing it and mm-hmm. makes the point. Nice. And they kind of get it that way. And I like don't do anything. I just play piano on that song, you know? Yeah. So it's cool. And he kind of kept the hype energy and shit going throughout the set. But yeah, I'm not. It's not like a put your hands up in the air type of thing. I mean, I do think at the shows we did where the audience was more like my fans, like the LA and New York headline shows, those shows were definitely a little bit more like turn up. Like they weren't moshing and shit, but people, you know, on You Up and on some of the songs people knew, like everyone was singing along. Everyone was kind of like jumping and it felt really good. And like, I think the more I'm able to play to those types of audiences and like build a fan base and shit, I'll probably like, I'll probably like learn how to do that stuff when they seem like they want that. Yeah. But it's like, I don't want to play to Shake's audience and spend the whole show being like, come on guys, like, <laughs> more energy, you know, like put your hands up, you know what I mean? Right. For me, it's like, nah, just like, just give a good fucking show, have the songs be good. The string players do a lot, I think, to keep people's attention just mm-hmm. because it's like yeah. immediately the stage opens and I, there's like an intro before I come on and they just play strings for 40 seconds before I do anything. It's just immediately like, holy shit, whatever the fuck this is is about to be great. I come on the stage and they're like, okay. Some people are like, who's that? Some people are like, oh, it's Johan, it's whatever. But it's like, and then the strings keep playing and I start singing and hopefully my singing sounds good and the songs are catchy and just after, and you know, I'm dressed in a cool way and just put it all together and hopefully it just kind of like, is just an interesting enough thing that it holds people's attention. And I think that is more or less what happened. You know, I have seen artists that are really good at just going on stage and just turning a dead crowd into like jumping up and down fans of their own shit somehow just by like mm-hmm. being incredible at the crowd work. But it's like, I don't know if that's like what I'm going for. Yeah, it's probably not true to you I, right now. If I like knew how to do that well and believably, I probably would have tried it a bit. You know, or like, okay, here's how the next song goes. Repeat after me. (laughs) It's like, I don't know. Is that really? It's it's a little bit out of character with the music and shit. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the balance we struck worked out pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I feel like once you have a song that would feel genuine to you, it would just come out naturally. Like you wouldn't even think twice about it, probably. Yeah. There's also, I mean, I don't like go to the club and I don't really like dance and shit. I know that's like, like you don't need to do that stuff to do it, but it's just like, it's not, I've always been kind of someone who just kind of like spaces out in the corner of a room and listens to music. So it's not, I don't yeah, really yeah. blame. I'm glad that people gave me more love than I probably would have given myself as a, you know, <laughs> this is only so much you can do. But yeah. there was also like, I think there's good moments in the set that like this with the strings where it's not, they're not just playing in the background, but there's like a few moments where I kind of like, finish a song and just kind of run over to them and start conducting mm. them and shit and it's like that's just exciting because it's like not anything you ever see happen in the middle of the song and it changes it up and, and people tended to applaud really hard and cheer a lot during those moments and then like there's just part of the set where I go and play the piano there's just like a lot of different things that happen that kind of keep people's attention I think those those things can do the trick without it having to be like me aggressively telling them what to do I guess you better like this song like <laughs> yeah exactly but you know I don't know people do that shit well so Maybe yeah so for it. you though um because you said like it was mainly two cities that like, you had like some of your own fan bases there so well yeah others... there was well there was two headline shows that I did right you know right yeah so like at these other spots though like uh the Detroit one or wherever like what songs did you see resonate with people who really weren't even your fans going into it that you were surprised about like yeah 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 yeah. i mean a bunch i mean i think um um there's a song called moderation on a like my second e for 30 p or some shit uh it's like drink too much smoke too much fuck it's like it's like anthemic i kind of knew that was going to be a good one to do live even though it never like streamed that good or anything i was just like I put it near the end of the set and that one went really well. It was a really nice. good. Yeah. And then uh 15 is the one that we had the phone lights out for. And that mm. that's an old song of mine. That also like barely ever got much in the way of streams, but like that song, like there was one dude, I forget his name, but he lives in California. He's like a diehard fan specifically of that song, who came to my I did like a release party in March that where I had like a big 
model, like a six foot tall model of my house and I served cocktails and I like had the string quartet playing, you know, and I had a room where you could play like Tony Hawk and shit. And it was just like, <laughs> it was like a whole like experience. It was really fun. Yeah. And that dude came to that event and just, and, then, and I was like out and about at my own event, like serving, I was like doing the bartending myself uh, until I performed it. And he was just like, dude, you're gonna play 15, right? I was just like, oh, I mean, I hadn't thought to. I mean, it's like, the song's like four years old and no one's like mentioned it since then. But, 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 but it is like a favorite song of mine too. And so I was like, all right, so whatever. So I like, I had the piano so I could like, just, I didn't have the track and all that shit prepped, but I, or the strings, but I did it as a piano version. And I was just like, yeah, it's a good song. And some people were doing the phone light thing even then. And I was just kind of like, shit, okay, this is a good one. So I like put that on the set and it's like become one of the most critical parts of the oh, that's awesome. night, I think. And that's, and then the phone light thing started happening. It's just like part of it. And it's like, I added this new kind of like, sort of like almost like gospel tinged, like just piano shit on top of it that was never in the record originally and just like the end result is just this song that is like a great moment on the set that never would have happened had it not been for touring so i feel like those those are a couple that you know and you up goes off with people that know it oh for um, sure like, i can't but, that'd be a fire to see that live yeah yeah those, but those on, the other, on the flip side devil's advocate was there one song that you like yo this is gonna hit crazy and you're like yo why aren't you guys like moving at all Um, I wish I could have been in the audience for it, but like I did like phases every night, and I like phases a lot. I, I think a lot of people really like that as a record. Really, like and it. I think it was. I don't think people weren't feeling it, but I mean, to me, that's like one of the more like up tempo songs mm -hmm. in a way. But I guess it's like also, it's very like chill at the same time, and it's like I, from what I, I I've never been obviously able to watch my own show. Right. right like Kanye says it's like my greatest regret because I would love to know what the fuck it is but like everyone who works on the team and stuff was saying that that's the one where the 808s really fucking shake the room so I kind of mm. expected there'd be more of a reaction to that because of that but it seems like it's more just kind of like a chill head nodding mm. type of one which like why with me but uh, yeah it's not I don't know if there's anywhere people are like really fucking moving good question I'm a mess maybe people tend to move a bit around for that one you up maybe did you do um oh my god the name's uh, skipping me right now but the one the song um where you mentioned your friend getting with your girlfriend oh yeah that's one i prepped when i did it's called smile like an idiot i, I yeah prepped, smile like uh, an idiot i prepped that one and i prepped a few others um that uh that i just didn't ultimately decide to do but yeah there, there's a few that are like ready to go if i ever wanted to throw them on um yeah. there was also one that i didn't prep that a lot of people asked for which was fuck this town off the new album um so yeah that that was and i like i kept saying like oh yeah once we get to like new mexico we'll have some time i'll like i'll like, <laughs> get the session set up so we can play back and i'll get the string parts right and all that type of shit it would have only taken me like an hour and a half but the mental energy to just do that and and like i think it's also like it's not like it's one thing to just prep it for a rehearsal and be like well if it's fucked we'll figure it out but prepping it knowing that it has to be right because we're going to do it once at sound check and then i have to remember enough about what we how we set it up and like you know it's just and then we got to do it at a show that night for like two thousand people it's just kind of like it just makes the the mental energy involved in prepping it feel like more even though it's like not that act, much actual work just like you can't really fuck it up so it just right. like, yeah, yeah it's not something i wanted to do on like that little sleep i guess so i decided i just like put it off but yeah Next time I'll just. But that's yeah, I feel like that's gonna be a good one for you to do live. Like, yeah, there's enough like um tempo-ness in that one, but still like lyrics that people like actually like sing along. Yeah, to. yeah, it's a good like sing along to one. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Cool. What about the uh, the Colbert sh uh, late night show that you were on Colbert, correct? Yeah. How did that all come together, and what was that? That was actually like? yeah. I mean, it's interesting because like because of COVID, like a lot of the late night shows for like a good year. Or two we're at their houses yeah right and they were and so the music performances really are not live in front of the studio audience they're just pre-taped and you can do as many takes as you want and just like send it you know what I mean? <laughs> so i like made those before knowing they were going to go anywhere and then like my the people on my like label pr whatever all the time shit like they, they got it on there and so they just ran it which is nice. great but like we made that and I have three more of those actually. I shot four songs that day. Oh shit. Oh wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. I have like a performance of You Up, which I think we're actually doing some what are we I think it's gonna be on Grammy.com or something. So the U Up performance will be there. And I'll probably use the other two just for like Instagram content and stuff like that. But yeah, 
That um, actually, the guys that filmed and edited that are those same people. The core that did all of uh, that's what they call themselves, but they did all of like Shake's uh, visuals and live documentation, all that type of stuff too. So, oh, nice. That, it was like fun working with them on that shit. I definitely want to do more with them. Nice. And how did it like? Did you feel like a tangible change in like the I don't know the outreach to you or maybe like followers or fans like after that performance? Yeah. How did that all feel? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's like basically every show I would just leave and there'd be like, you know, 20 or 30 DMs, which is like, you know, as a percentage of the people that had just seen me, like not super high, but you got to imagine it's like beyond that number. There's also people that are just silently listening to the music or who are going to remember the show forever. And like, or, you know, just who just don't are the type of person who like has to take a video and tag you, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, but, but then with the 20 and 30, it's nice because you can actually respond to them and be like, oh shit, thanks for coming. Like, go, you know, check out the album, what, what, what was your favorite song, whatever. And so, yeah, I mean, just after 20 shows of that, I mean, that's like five or 600 people that I'm now directly in touch with and way more new followers that I don't, that I'm not in touch with, you know, that I'm not like messaging with, but you know, even just 500 people that are actually like focused on me and my music, uh, and are excited about what I'm trying to do and hopefully going to come next time or whatever i mean that yeah it felt amazing and, and just like even just the in-person stuff after the show because i would come and hang at my like merch table after with the t-shirts oh and, nice yeah and like because it's like i'm an opener it's like it's like you may as well just like like i'm not too good to do it's like no nah, <laughs> it's not beneath me like if you're the headliner <laughs> i mean you can like charge for a meet and read or whatever which, which is i'm sure what i'll eventually do but like at this point it's just nice to just be out there and just be like, oh, what's up? Hey, I'm y'all. And they're like, oh, you're that guy from the thing. I get a picture. It's like, yeah, you can sign my like shoe or some shit. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> or face or whatever. You know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that stuff was amazing. It's just like all of that. I've been saying this a lot, but all of that is just so much better of an experience than like watching streaming numbers go up on a, yeah. an app, you know, which like is cool. And if it's like crazy numbers, that can be cool. But even then it's like, I don't know what those numbers mean unless I also see like DMs and comments and stuff from people. It's like, it's unless, even if it's like three words, like yo, sick song or something, it's like that, that's at least a person writing that. And I just have no idea what the fuck a number of streams. Yeah. Right. That's a great point. That kind of actual human component to it. So yeah, that aspect of it. And with, with all that admiration and love, obviously comes trolls, haters, people like that. Like even on the, the Colbert video, I was oh, just yeah, sure. scrolling through and like I saw a lot of positive ones and I was excited to see people's reception because you were uh, a yeah. new discovery for us. But then, of course, right. there's haters who are like he can't sing and auto tune this right, and all right, kinds right. of shit. So how do you filter through the bullshit and kind of stay focused, but also keep a pulse on like what's working? Because I feel like if you're I mean, up and coming, you kind of have a balance. It's usually the hate is usually I find it usually comes from people that like, I'm not big enough that they're like finding me where I'm at to like, just shit on my work. Really? That's not happening. It's more people who are there. Um, like they, like my shit has been like forced on them in some way mm. because I was reposted by someone or it was, and not even that as much because a person that they trust is one thing, but like, a site that they follow close to my video. It's like, it's like, they're just, they see it as like sponsored content. Like the Colbert yeah. thing, it's just like, they don't, they just watch the Colbert channel and see what that posts. It's like, they don't, they don't right. anything. You know what I mean? Whereas yeah. like the Shake fans are like, you know, the fact that I'm there is somewhat like her saying that she fucks with me. Yeah, I mentioned that I worked on her album in the live show. That was the thing I did also. Like I, I speak about myself usually for about 30 seconds after the, like the second song, just to be like, here's what my deal is. And like, I always start by just saying like, you know, I was working on Shake's album and then she was like, Hey, you want to come on and tour with me? Whatever. And like, so it's like, okay. Like if, if you're paying attention, then it's like, okay, cool. Well, this, like the person that I'm here to see fucks with this dude, like, it's kind of like, even if yeah. I'm not feeling it, it's not going to be like disrespectful. It's just kind of like, either I yeah. do or, you know. So I think that that, yeah. So like the Colbert thing, I mean, I didn't really read the comments. I do think like that audience is a lot older. So you probably get a lot more of that. Like, <laughs> I'm just yeah. rock bands used to play. Colbert, <laughs> like, who fucking knows who that even is coming from. It's like not really yeah. the audience, you know. So I don't really care. Um, but 
I don't really see that much. I mean, yeah, every once in a while, like somebody, like a couple of the Kanye fan pages and podcasts and stuff on Twitter post about me a lot because they're homies and they like my work and yeah. Kanye and all that. But, you know, sometimes there'll be a comment being like, how much did you get paid to do this? And they're always like, nothing. But it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like kids are just fucking dumb sometimes. And it's like, you know, a lot of times the person writing that behind it, it's like, I've made the mistake of like getting into it with people once or twice. Mm-hmm. And you, the, the end of it is always either they're like 11 years old. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, <laughs> what the fuck is wrong? Like, clearly, like, why am I talking? You know? Yeah. It's cool. They're, it's like, I don't even blame them. Like, it's just yeah. like, I'd probably do the same thing, you know? Or it's like, sometimes you like go through their page and it's just like, or like on Twitter, you can do this. You can just like see who they reply to and shit. And it's just like, everything is hate to everyone. Mm. It's not personal. Yeah. It's nothing to do with me at all. It's just purely that is the only way they interact with the end of the world. It's just hatred. It's yeah. Just, so it's like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. Even that's with this good. podcast, we've we've dealt with that. But it kind of sounds like the the short story is your target demographic most likely is either going to fuck with you or be respectful if they do yeah. have a disagreement. Yeah. The, I but, mean, the more the yeah. more frustrating part of it, I think, is just, and it's not like I'm not bitter or complaining about it it's just the reality of how this stuff works but it's like the vast majority of people who will eventually fuck with what you're doing are not hardcore fans Mm. they're not not gonna fuck with it until it's just like overwhelmingly the way things are going around Mm. them you know what i mean yeah Yeah. and it's like those people could see your shit 10 times but until it's like two of their friends are like yo this yawn shit's crazy you know what i mean yeah. So you're like waiting for the critical mass of that to happen, kind of. So it's like that early fan base is just the fucking hardest to maintain because they don't know anyone else that fucks with you. There's no one. They just have to keep the faith alive. You know what I mean? And be loyal. And it's like the type, you know, there's not that the type of person that like gets down with an artist that early on when no one in their friend group is fucking with it. I don't think that's very many people. You know what I mean? And so it's like very hard to find them. And then they, they have to fight each other, which is almost impossible yeah. when there's a small number of them. But as it gets bigger and bigger, it gets easier. And then at some point, it just hits this critical mass where, like, those, like, the, the main core group of what it's ultimately going to be. Well, I wouldn't call it the core. It's the, it's like, it's the opposite of the core. It's everybody else, but like, ni- which is going to be 90% of the people who come to your shows and yeah. shit while you're popping, they'll get on board exactly when they ha- feel like they have to at the yeah. very last minute when it's just like oh i don't want to miss this train yeah, yeah yeah but is and there getting the back in effect it's like oh it's popular now let's fucking jump on yeah. is there any and concern that it would flip like the core fan base now is poking holes and saying oh he changed he's no longer doing this and he's going pop or commercial yeah i mean or the goal the is, is not to do that and it's i think it's why you see there are some artists um who I don't want to name. I'm trying to think if I could name any of them. I don't really want to name any of them. But just some artists that are like really, really respected and seen as really cool, who behind closed doors will say they like all they want is to have a hit and be as famous as mm. their like much more famous friends who are like real stars, you know? And they're not gonna get there without making a hit song and making a hit song off, depending on what the sound is that they're starting with, is a really hard thing to do. Like, The weekend is kind of one of the only artists I've really seen just, like, transfer his sound into the pop radio shit and do it with that in a way that didn't just fucking turn off that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And most yeah, of these yeah. people are just too afraid. And then I've seen people try and make something, and then everyone's like, why did they make that song like that? It's like, that shit sucks. And it didn't succeed in the pop shit, and then their fans didn't like it either. So it's like, then they, they lost all everything. You know what I mean? Which is yeah. what those artists are generally afraid is going to happen. But I've always been clear that like what I want to do is be a pop star and then revitalize classical music and shit. And like the songs I've been putting out have been very, it's like they are commercial pop driven songs. Like like I think they're cool and I think I do them in an interesting way. And I think I have something to say in the music and the lyrics and the strings and stuff is like, I don't think anyone else makes the type of music I do, but I am a hundred percent trying to make hits and I'm not, you know, and it's like, Maybe that makes it slower initially to gain the fan base of people that are like diehards, but like that you'll never escape from. Yeah. But I think in the long run, it's like I have been consistent and I'm not going to, you know what I mean? It's like, I think that, I don't know. 
whatever. <laughs> no, that's that's a great point. I mean, that's kind of like you were explaining like the blueprint for us, like even doing interviews with, like up and coming artists. Like that's what we're trying to like be a part of, right? Like us, us discovering our artists, and that helps. Yeah. You know, a, a couple hundred more people find that than like that fan base, bro. Right? So. Yeah, that's yeah. It's it's very hard though. Like getting any kind of movement of people from the ground up excited about you is like fucking impossible. Have you 100%. felt a moment then as like, again, like you said, like you're getting 50 to 60 DMs after a show. Have, besides that though, have you felt like a moment, like just like the last like three months, like, oh wow, like this is next level shit that I really did not expect. Like when, when you were like fantasizing about this moment. Like either like a certain artist hitting you up or just like the shit you get invited to. It's, I mean, I, not in the past month or two. No, I mean, it's it's like, I mean, the billboards in LA were pretty sick. I've, that's always been oh, something that's oh, yeah, really nice. cool, yeah. And that was just because the site music.com fucked with me and that's, I think Pharrell owns it or something. But I mean, that's cool. I, I mean, the Colbert thing was cool. It's a lot of stuff that I've like, I mean, I always wanted over for a seven or shake. I've wanted that for like three or four years now. You know, oh, nice. like, yeah. So like the fact that it actually happened, but it was like, it's just kind of like it was almost going to happen for so long that it kind of when it actually did and then it was so last minute i had to get ready there wasn't this kind of like like there hasn't just been any like totally out of the blue mm. just like i'm this is fucking blowing up beyond you know in a way that is not me pushing it's just like i'm still in it like i'm really really just pushing as hard as i fucking can yeah. every day and like it probably looks, and I hope it looks like things are coming together because they are. Oh, it looks, bro. But, trust me, it looks. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, it's like, but it just that it hasn't hit that critical mass where just everyone's fucking talking about me. And just yeah, like, yeah. Holy fuck, like if you who is this guy? You know what I mean? I think in LA it has a bit, and I think it also just does around my producing and stuff. But just like, yeah, I mean, when that happens, I'll be able to do a headlining tour, and you'll it'll things will just change overnight. I hope, and but I'm still in that. I think about like Russ or something, you know, like that dude was at it for so long, you know. And dude, it's like, like a song every day coming out. Yeah, exactly. And just not, there was never a point where it was just like an overnight. I mean, I think at some point it all started to kind of like go like this. And like, it's, you know, if you look at the curve, even of like the streams I have and like, there is like this kind of like this that's been happening just over the past sort of nine months as I've been rolling this album out. But it's yeah. like, this is like only the beginning of like this. And you don't right. really know what part of the curve you're on. It's so, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's just, uh, you just keep grinding and you don't, you don't really try to assume that anything is deserved or about to happen or whatever. And I'm just very like, keep my head down. And that's you know. right. I was gonna say like, so keeping your head down, like being the grind. So like, just like, a, I know you're not a competition with these people, but like when you see that your release date is the same as Kendrick, you're like, Really, bro? Or like, does that not even matter to you? Like, a lot of people like, were kind of, yeah, a lot of people were like, why, like, before it happened, were like, oh shit, are you gonna, you don't wanna go ahead and are you gonna push it back? Like, <laughs> I don't really see how that in any way relates to, like, who is the person who is like listening to Kendrick and because of that, not listening? It's like, you don't right. have bars like Kendrick? Right. I don't know. It's like, yeah, <laughs> music, it's, like, and it's so much bigger. I mean, even if it was the same lane as me, too, it's just kind of like, I mean, I guess he kind of is a little bit, but it's just sort of like, yeah, I don't know. I guess the idea is that maybe some people just don't have the bandwidth to pay attention more than one thing at once, but it's just like, there's always some huge artist dropping. I don't know. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm cool with it. And it's like, you should be promoting your album more than just the day it drops. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Maybe like keep talking about it after that, you know, maybe before <laughs> for a while. So it's like, you know, it's just still growing. So every day it's a few more people being like, yo, this album's nuts. Nice. That's yeah. great. That's all I want. So. And speaking of the album, I mean, we obviously both loved it, but I, I feel like your musical persona, at least up until this point, was kind of like a, a person who feels like they haven't, figured life out yeah. or isn't sure what their future is going to look like yeah. obviously like with you having a billboard and going on tour and things kind of coming together do you feel like that will shift how the content or music sounds uh moving forward or do you think nah i don't know it'll be yeah i guess i guess it'll be interesting what happens if i get really i think i'd have to get like really rich for the because i think most of what it's really about is more just like the the pursuit the chaos it looks like the album i mean there is like some stuff in there about like me trying to chase a dream i guess especially on the last song away from me but like and that's i think that's like maybe the most personal song where i'm really just like this is what it's like my personal version of this looks like but i think most mostly the album is like 
like I'm a mess is just about being really fucking drunk like that's not gonna change you know <laughs> get my shit together is about just like me just physically like being a, a mess sometimes and like that's not gonna change either unless I get really rich and have like a person who just fucking you know it's like I just <laughs> live I live a chaotic <laughs> life that doesn't resemble the like white picket fence American dream thing partly because I'm a musician but I think partly also because like almost nobody I know lives that life and like it was one of the that, album cover by the way was, was fire thank you yeah it's literally it's pretty much literal literally. <laughs> Yes, and it is just exactly what the album's about, which is just like trying to grow up while the sky's on fire. And I think that I was trying to just sort of sum up how I feel like a lot of people feel, where it just doesn't feel like like the American dream and sort of like these just classic trappings of adulthood and just like being a person and just what it means to do that shit correctly. Like that stuff just doesn't exist anymore. And nobody really knows what the right way to do anything is. And nobody knows what benchmarks they're supposed to hit to feel like they've that they haven't that they're not fucking up and like that's like what it's about and i don't i don't really think i mean i'm not married i'm definitely not having kids i don't have a house i mean i have an apartment i guess but it's like i don't have a steady job i mean that's because i'm a musician but yeah, yeah, yeah i'm just saying like in a sense it's like it's more just about like not knowing how, whether you've grown up or how to grow up right so I the guess. chaos is gonna still be there like, that's what I'm saying and I mean if I get more yeah. successful that'll probably be more the case at least for a while you know it's like yeah. every, every artist who's like blowing up like their songs are almost about how like they like all they do is party now because you know they're just rich that's what happens people, <laughs> yeah. yeah and people want you to come to shit all the time and you just you don't want to say no and you want to enjoy the ride while it lasts it's yeah but dude I feel like when you were explaining the, the, your tour life I feel that could be a whole fucking album like chaos and like in that itself like just like the planning the doing the just... yeah yeah I think that's true I think there'll be, I'm working on it right now. I don't know. It's like, I got to figure it out. I definitely, I have a song called Lost in America on there. So, I mean, it's like definitely, I think thematically it's not going to be super different, but I'll probably find some ways to, I think on this last album, there was a lot of stuff on there that I did to kind of be funny about it. Maybe like there's a lot of jokes in the album. Yeah. There, like, I, I can't remember the jokes. name of the song, but like when you're like, am I killing it? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like yeah. that shit. Hey, I was dying here. That shit. Like, yeah. It's that a joke. Like, like get my shit together. It's like, I talk about how I've got like, you know, there's dead plants. I'm glad I didn't get a dog, you know, like, <laughs> take care of anything, you know, the yeah. dog would be dead. Right. It's like, whatever. It's like, there's whatever. And then the chorus, I get my shit together. It's like, you know, save the date. Don't be late. Getting married on the fourth of never, you know, it's like, there's just a lot of jokes on there. Dude, there's moments where I think about like forgetting Sarah Marshall and like Jason Siegel's character with the like uh puppet Dracula thing. Like that, Why? like in the, in the most positive way though. That's not an insult. Sure. No, like I'm saying. Like, <laughs> I'll take it. I love that movie. Uh, Get him to the Greek, also a good movie. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think I, we'll see. I, I think I'm maybe gonna be like slightly less funny on the next mm -hmm. album. Maybe I will be. Maybe I won't. I just feel like I don't know. I might just be more direct. Or I, actually, you know, I might be like less direct. We'll see. I think the funniness is funny because it, it's like, hey, I'm here. And I feel like I might go a little more just like poetic and weird with some of the lyrics on the next shit. I think that. Being around Shake maybe has made me just want to try some stuff like that because she does that really well. Like you, the lyrics are very like it's it's not like it's they don't they're not as like just beat you over the head with what the point of the song is kind of which is mm -hmm. more yeah because I feel like with your jokes in the songs like it's not like haha -ha funny it's like oh this still goes with the, like the idea of the song but like you're also like yeah aware like it makes I you smart but you can relate so it's yeah. not. Yeah. that funny because you're like oh shit i am kind of like depressed about this shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had a question to ask you about this song which was again the, the shorter songs on the album like it felt like almost like yeah. a, like a play or something like it, it was super dope on aimless when like the beat starts going like super like distorted like how did that yeah. idea even come to you bro because that shit was like genius to me but, like how did well, that you come caught that it does it at the end of the album too right Yes. Yeah, everyone yeah, always yeah. everyone always mentions aimless, but it's like it happens twice, obviously. So I got nervous because I bought yeah, some I'm like, AirPods. Yo, my speakers fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get new AirPods, and I was yeah, like, I've done that a lot. Okay. I mean, yeah, like it. I did it on the end of the album. I'm pretty sure I did the end of the album first. I think. I think. Yeah, I think I decided. I'm, I, I'm, I could be wrong. This is like a year or two ago that I decided to do that, but I think. 
I think the end of Get My Shit Together, I think I was like, the album should just kind of like, just devolve into just noise, basically. Mm. And then the noise should go on like really uncomfortably long at the end of the album. And then I think because I did it there, I was just like, I want to do it somewhere else. Because it's like, I want to foreshadow that that's going to yeah. happen. Mm, that's it. And then I think the way it ended up kind of coming together for me was the aimless... I mean, there's a lot of references to driving on the album. Fuck This Town's pretty much the whole song is just driving. And then You Up, I kind of like, I mean, I guess the video at least takes place in the backseat of the car. And like uh, on the, on I'm a Mess, talking about Ubering home and like the suburbs just to me and growing up in like suburban Massachusetts is very like about driving around a lot. Um, and the, I mean, Aimless, I guess, I think if the lyric actually references that, but I mean, certainly like it's about having no direction and going, right. you know, but so the way I kind of hear that sound is that it sort of, to me, sounds like the car stereo when you lose reception sometimes on it, when you like leave a radio station and yeah. the, or whatever, and then like you like moving into a new area where there's a new one, it just, it like pretty much makes that noise with that exact kind of distortion. So to me, that's kind of what it felt like. It's just sort of like this driving, off like you're, you're kind of driving around directionlessly throughout the whole album in my view sure but it's like on that song you really just start kind of like going off course and off the grid which is what the song's about and then the album ends with just fully going off course and just that's the end it's just, you don't come back from it so it's a little bleak maybe but that was kind of my uh, no dude it was genius like once i realized my speakers were working i was like yo this is genius yeah thank you yeah I'm trying to think if there's any other. There's also a moment at the end of um, hitting different. It goes into this like slow part where there's like the soons playing and just the sound of people like playing like flip cup and party mm. noise and shit that I just got off like YouTube and shit. And like I wanted that. That's sort of like the intermission of the album for me is after hitting different. Although it ends up going straight into burning sky, which I added at the end. But but there's a pause where I'm just kind of. It's just like. At the end of hitting different, it's just sort of like this dude's not going to figure this shit out at all. He's not, and he's going to stop trying. And then he just kind of like devolves into the slow music, and you just hear like vague party sounds. It's kind of like, oh, we're guess we're just exactly where we started. Nothing has no progress has been made. <laughs> and then it kind of reaches. Then then it kind of goes into like the kind of dark part of the album where I sort of get more desperate about trying to get this girl to hang with me again, and like phases where I'm kind of like lashing out at all my friends a little bit. And then finally, don't wait for me, where I basically just tell the girl, like, you can, it's fine, just go to your thing. Um, I'm gonna, but it's like, but it is like, don't wait for me ends with me sort of saying, like, I'm gonna try to figure this out. It's, I don't know how long it'll take, but it is like somewhat of like, a, okay, like, just give me some time and I'll work sure. on it. And just figure out what my life is supposed to look like, which is, but it's like, that's all life is really. And I think the point of the album is maybe also just to accept that it's okay not to know where you're headed or what or to feel like you've reached somewhere i guess yeah and then just like destinations just aren't a thing anymore. it's weird to me that it feels right. like nobody else really talks about this kind of stuff but you would think they would because it's so relatable um which is why i love the music so much because even for me like i mean we're both in our 30s yeah. half the time i don't know if i want kids or if i should even get a house or the most basic decisions that or yeah. I guess they're not too basic, but decisions that you've been conditioned to just make just because everyone else is doing it. Exactly. But a lot of people don't really think about it. And I think musically it's important because it seems like everybody else has it figured out, at least as far as popular music goes. Yeah. Thank you. I got one more question about the album. I know we got to let you go in a second here, but uh, use the word intermission, which is like a perfect word because it feels like like a play and like there's moments where like I don't know the stage is being done and then like you, like you put on a song and so like you have a few yeah. really short songs like uh or I guess like interludes like um some sort of intent like that's yeah. a great little break and then it goes into something else and obviously yeah, yeah. one would um you said burning sky is almost like I think it's like only like 95 seconds long yeah. like that. so was that an, obviously intentional but like how, like were you thinking about this like a movie or a play it definitely started to get out of hand a little bit <laughs> like the 070 shake one like she was originally gonna be on one of the full songs and then she okay. was like no i want to do an interlude instead it's just like i really wanted her on the album and i really liked what she did and it fit perfectly there but then i was just like wow this album is kind of like half interludes but it kind of like i think it, it worked works. Though, yeah yeah partly because of the message of the album uh but i think also like 
a lot of them really could have been like, like full songs part, well they could have just been attached to the song that they're mm. next to kind of yeah like like some sort of intent that's the one that's after you up i think right um it's after that top of us it's definitely after you up it's gotta be after you up. it's after oh. you up. okay cool Talk about so that. yeah no it's okay hey yeah, everybody makes mistakes <laughs> so, yeah so i mean that like at one point that was just gonna be that was just you up which is gonna be a four minute song that ended with a minute long voice memo gotcha but it was just kind of like for playlisting so it's like it plays the same so it's really important to me that if people are listening to the album straight through they're no hearing it like you shouldn't really yeah and you shouldn't really fucking even notice where the songs start and stop in a lot of cases you know because in a lot of cases the track break is just to like block off a single so that it can be a single mm -hmm. and then still like you know what i mean so i feel like some sort of intent really is just that's just part of you up aimless aimless comes straight out of fuck this town i mean that could have been one song really hitting different and burning sky those play straight together that could have been yeah. one song uh what uh what do you want to be and don't wait for me that literally is like the intro what do you want to be is the intro to don't wait for me so it's like if you kind of like if you look where the actual track breaks or where the music actually stops it's like it's really like the album is more like 10 tracks some of which are just like double songs that kind of gotcha. i don't know if that makes any difference but you know no, I mean, I, I did like the feel it's of more like, visually, yeah. like for the listener, like it made it more cinematic. Like I could only like see this shit playing out, like on a play, yeah, go. that's good. And I mean, yeah, I don't really know what the right answer for that is. I mean, honestly, like if, if it weren't like just fucking the death sentence for like streaming and shit, like I'd probably be just dropping albums as like forty minute one tracks. That would, <laughs> that would literally be my preferred way that people listen to this stuff. I don't think yeah. that. You know what I mean? So it's like, I think if that might be the better way to think about what some of this stuff is supposed to be doing, but I don't know. I oh, mean, it worked, dude. It worked. I really I, like, I, and I'm really like a big fan of like Astroworld and shit, where like those songs are mostly, you know, a lot of those songs have like two or three parts of them anyway. Mm -hmm. So it does just like, if you listen to that album straight through, like I find, unless you're like a diehard fan, like, you know, on a first listen to that album, you really don't necessarily know where the songs are. Or Yeezus is actually a great one. That one, you really cannot fucking tell where the song started or stopped. If you don't know that album backwards and forwards, if you just play that, like the first time I remember listening to it, it's just like, I have no idea when I'm good. <laughs> because every song is, is like three or four totally different ideas chopped up together. And then it goes straight into the next one without any fanfare at all. And I love that. That makes me, it's just like, it gives it such a shape that isn't just like, here's a playlist of yeah. a bunch of three minute songs. It's like, no, it's this whole continuously flowing thing that we've just sort of like chopped up in certain mm. places for convenience. And I think that is sort of how I thought about this too. And I think I'm probably going to go further with that on the next album. I think on the next album, you're really not, like the songs are going to be barely, like you're going to really have a hard time telling where like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I feel so like that's when that, people go crazy at, at concerts too. Cause like, a lot of the anticipation gets built up like when one song ends and the other one starts yeah and it's just a whole different vibe but it it, it all flows together yeah good i have like one more question before we get out of here Is it yeah sure uh i guess what's what's next for you on the the roadmap for 2022 what you got in the works and There's what are you looking so forward much, to man i mean i'm yeah i've got i'll probably do a strings version of this album um like as like a remix of it almost uh, at some point i'm gonna put out i think probably if i can legally i guess the nirvana cover that i did on the road which is the song dumb i'm actually working that right this minute nice. um i will i'll probably put out the classical set i did too as like a film not a film like a 15 minute video that you just literally watch that set if you missed it because it's just crazy I'm, uh, I've got this side project I'm doing that's just a bunch of classical composers and rappers like woven together onto a like, that one's much weirder than this it's it's like those are not songs either it's just fucking like just full on like experimental musical textures that occasionally like some somewhat famous rapper shows up on top of and like that's gonna be sick uh, it's called Iso Monstrosity I made it with like six classical composers and 11 rappers and singers during damn 19, yeah like Shit. A year ago. that's gonna come out and then I'm working on my second solo album and I'm going to try to finish that in the next two months or so, so I can film some videos and start rolling it out in the winter. So I just like, and, all, and aside from that, I just want to get back on tour. So it's just like, if you know anybody, 
you know any like big artists that have big followings that I need to like scoop up their fans you know just tell them I want we got a guy wanna, we got a guy just tell yeah tell like fucking trippy red to take me out you know tell like, <laughs> you know what I mean I really just really want to just keep doing that shit because that was the fucking best that was like some of the most fun I've ever had ever I just felt like the closest to like what I've been trying to do for so long that I just yeah I want to get right yeah back. I saw your TikTok about um it said like if you like Post Malone or St. John and I forget who the third person was but I thought those three were like a perfect yeah, yeah. fan base to kind of extract from trying it's hard to figure out how those get booked sometimes shake at work because I just knew her but yeah it's like how does how does St. John decide who to take out as an opener you know Right. right. But we'll if any ideas out. come up, we'll, we'll definitely let you we'll know. You. But yo, sure. this is the guy. Reach out to him. DM it, please. <laughs> yeah. Call, call St. John. <laughs> <laughs> he is always in Miami. I might just stop by. Um, listen, man, we want to thank you a million for doing thank this. You. Uh, having a follow up episode with you is phenomenal. Uh, we appreciate you fucking with us. Like, letting us. We're letting you know for now. We're big fans, man. And I, everything you do has just been great. Dude, so thank we can't you. wait until next thing. They're great questions. I appreciate how much you like pay attention and actually, you know, put thought into it. Oh, hundred percent. Big fans. Yeah. Thank you. And it's always I'll exciting to see the the changes over time. We'll obviously keep oh, yeah. in touch and thanks for following up so much too. I'm sorry this got so fucking hectic. Next time oh, I'll just like fine. next time we'll just uh yeah, I'll just schedule it myself. No, so we didn't fine. expect you to to drop the tour for us. Yeah, but. yeah. We like yeah, it's all good. We'll figure it out. <laughs> but it's like pretty easy to do like it's it's easy to do the show on tour because there is lots of downtime, but it's just hard to know when it's going to be. Sure. Yeah. You just, they just get to the venue, you're like, oh, I guess we have two extra hours. And it's like, well, this would be a good time. Right. But it's like, I don't know, you know. But so. my, from my perspective, I'm like, I'm sure the last thing he'd want to do after hopping off stage is getting on a, a camera for like another two hours or whatever it is. You think yeah, that, yeah. but honestly, no, but you come off, I mean, I can't usually then because I got to like go entertain people in the room, but like, Usually I'm like kind of high from just the fucking rush and I want to keep the momentum going. Oh, that's like it's usually a great time to do that. Like yeah. I just want to do something. I don't want to, you know, yeah. so whatever. That's All right, when you're on tour with Trippy, we're going to hit you up. Like, yo, after your set, just hop well, on where, the live Yeah, show. where are you guys at right now? <laughs> uh, I'm in South Florida, so like right yeah. outside Miami. I know, and I'm in uh, San Francisco. Miami. Got it. So we did go to Sacramento, but I know it's not San Francisco, but... And, and yeah, Miami it sucks that we didn't go anywhere near there, but I really wanted yeah, to. Yeah, I was trying. Yeah, you, yeah, no, I didn't see anything for Florida, Florida when we were tour days. Stupid, but you know, there's always some random shit with how stuff gets scheduled. But like, yeah, definitely want to get to Atlanta and Florida, stuff like that. But yeah, and then we should just do it in person because oh, that'd whichever be sick, one on that first. Because that's what we did. Like uh, two of the Boston podcasts that I've been on, I did two nights in Boston. Those guys, one of them came to one night and give and we oh. did like a green room interview, and the other guys came to the other night. We did green room interview. So it's like that's nice. Cool. Oh, for sure, dude. Yeah. New York, LA, we'll, we'll make it. Oh, or, yeah, again, Florida, yeah. we'll make it happen. Sick. Awesome, brother. For we sure. appreciate you, man. Uh, Blair, let them okay. know where they can peep us, peep him, and get out of here. Yes. Yeah, you can check us out Thank on you. all platforms, audio-theory.com. We'll, of course, put uh, links to your album and everything else in the description box Thank on you. YouTube. But really appreciate it. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, do everything you can to support sure. this man. And, you know, tune in early because he's going to blow up at some point, so. Huge. Appreciate it. Thank Peace. You. Peace.